It is live. It is live. Yes. We just need to mute. So our so it is live now. It's just um taking a while to show. And I want to make sure that I mute the YouTube. I want to make sure my phone is on mute and I don't know. I may just turn it off. I just turn it off there. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Roseanne Hello. from Sweet Arrow. And we have Brittany, who's co-hosting down here with us. She's like the best, the best. We love Brittany. Um, and let me introduce, uh, let's start with Stephanie. So Stephanie Garber is a number one New York Times and international best-selling author of Once Upon a Broken Heart, The Ballad of Never After, and the Caraval Trilogy. Her books, her books have been translated into 30 languages. Yay. All right. And then we have Ellie Carter. Um, she's a best-selling author of novels that have epitomized action adventure YA romance for more than a decade from spy-centric humor of I'll tell you, I love you, but then I'd have to kill you to the globe-trotting glamour of high society and the nonstop thrill ride of Not If I Save You First. The name Ellie Carter is synonymous with hilarious action and heart-pounding romance. Her first original screenplay, A Castle for Christmas, was recently number one on Netflix. Now she's bringing her trademark style voice, voice to the adult rom-com market. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for having us. All right. I'm going to mute myself and you can take it away. All right. Okay. I... I am so excited to be here with you tonight, Allie. Thank you um, for letting me be your in-conversation partner. Thank you for doing it. My gosh, I'm so, we have Stephanie Garber here. Today. <laughs> Big deal. Oh my gosh. So, well, okay. So I, I never chatted with Allie Carter before I saw the announcement for the Blonde Identity. I had read and loved the High Society series when it first came out. Um, I won't get into that, but... <laughs> Um, because I could spend a lot of time, but anyways, I remember seeing the announcement for this book and being like, this has all my favorite tropes. I feel like this is written for me and I need to be friend Allie Carter so that she'll send me an arc. Um, that was my plan because I, I just loved everything in the book. And then I read the book and I loved it as much as I thought I would, because it has spies, amnesia, grumpy sunshine, twins, and it's super, super tropey. It's also written by Allie Carter. So I was like, I'm going to love this. And I did. Um, so I'm really, really excited to ask you questions tonight. And my first question is, I'm really curious how you got the idea for this book. And if you have any personal experience waking up in Paris with amnesia. Yes, I do it all the time. And there's always like a really smoking hot guy standing over you being like, yeah, uh, no, I wish. Um, so I, this, this, this book came about a few different ways. Uh, first of all, I have always loved spies and spies have always been sort of, you know, part of my id. And I wrote, of course, the Gallagher Girl series, which is a teen spy series for a long time. And I was thinking, you know, I'd love to do another spy thing. And then one day kind of an idea came to me and it was really, it was that opening scene. It was the, a woman's lying in the snow and she's coming awake very, very slowly. And the lights are swirling and the snowflakes are falling. And then the lights kind of take on a form and she realizes that it's the Eiffel Tower and she knows she's in Paris. And so she doesn't know who she is. She doesn't know how she got there. She doesn't know why she's lying in the snow. She doesn't know anything. She just knows she's in Paris. And a guy leans over her and yells, get up, Alex, run. And the only thing I knew for a fact is that she wasn't Alex. And so for years, years, I tried to make that work as a YA idea. I was like, okay, well, she's a teenage girl and he's a teenage boy. And, you know, and her identical twin sister is a spy and he is a spy, but he kind of works on the other side, you know, and I had this whole thing planned. But the problem is, is that I had already done my teen spy franchise. And so it's really, really hard to come up with a reasonable reason why a teenage girl would, would be a spy. And so I felt like I had already done my version of that that made sense to me and that I felt like I could write. And I just kind of kept trying and then it just not working. And then I was on the phone with Rachel Hawkins uh, year, a couple of years ago 
And Rachel's book, uh, The Ex Hex, had just come out. And she was talking about how great it was and how her ex, her Hex Hall YA readers were now adults. And it was so fun to kind of catch up with those readers again. And she's like, "You, I want you to write an adult book. You would like writing an adult book. And I said, I, I, no, I don't have any, any adult readers. I don't. And she's like, no, they're the same reader. They're like, they're just, they're just in their twenties and thirties now. And I was, I don't have any adult idea. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Take that old twin idea. And instead of like trying to figure out a way for a teenage girl to be a spy, just make her a CIA agent. And then I was like, wait a second. Like literally every problem that I had had with that idea went away in like, and, and Rachel was like, th that book doesn't work because they're not teenagers, they're adults. And as soon as I made them adults, I knew, I knew within 30 seconds exactly what the book was. And so it was one of those things is, you know, they talk about, you know, overnight success happens over 20 years or something like that. I feel like this is a book idea that I, I got in like 15 seconds because I've been literally thinking about it probably for eight or nine years. And so that's, that is it. And, and, and Zoe and Sawyer just like, I immediately sat down and emailed my agent and she was like, yeah, no, let's go, let's do it. And um, so it was, it was really meant to be. And I, 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 I thank Rachel for that, for, for bossing me around and telling me what to do. Oh my gosh. That is such a cool story. And I also, I, I didn't want to ask, cause I was like, maybe it's personal, but I uh, um, read the acknowledgements and you had mentioned, like you thanked Rachel for telling you the exact mm -hmm. thing you needed to hear at the exact yeah. moment you needed to hear it. Was that that was it. Because I had, you know, I'd been writing YA for a long time. I'd written middle grade. I'd written this screenplay. You know, I, I was going a lot of different directions and I, I couldn't quite decide like, okay, there are these three roads ahead of me. Which, which one do I go down? Like I had, I was standing at a literal crossroads and Rachel's like, no, you go down this road. And I was like, oh no, no, I don't know anybody down that road. She's like, no, all of your friends moved to the end of this road trust me, this is what you do. And, and honestly, I just never really thought I always was a romance reader. And so I, but, and, and honestly, people would ask me for a lot, like, why don't you, cause I, I went through a phase where I read a ton of historical romance and they're like, or will you ever write that? But like, no, because that's, that's what I read. Like that's that I, you, are you the same way, Stephanie? Like when you're, you're, when you're working on a certain genre, reading that genre becomes a bit of a challenge because you can't turn off your internal editor. Yes. Yes. I, well, and it, yes, I feel like I don't read as much fantasy as I should. And yeah. also I feel like it really shows though, that you're a romance reader reading this book. Like it, as a big romance reader, I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I like how to read to romance. <laughs> I just love it. It's, it is the only thing that makes me happy sometimes. And, and that I, I was always afraid to write it. Cause I was like, will I stop loving it if I start writing it? And so I think by, by making it more like my version of a story, you know, it's like my, uh, when Ryan Johnson talks about uh, Knives Out, he talks about how he wanted to take an Alfred Hitchcock engine and put it in an Agatha Christie car. And so what I wanted to do with this is I wanted to take a uh, JJ Abrams or a uh, Robert Ludlum engine and put it in a Jennifer Cruzy car. That's what I wanted to do here. And so once I did that, I was like, okay, so I'm not, I, I, I can still, you know, I can differentiate kind of, um, and, and still, still, still like a, you know, a book about a Duke who's hot for the governess. Like uh, I can turn, I can still turn off my internal editor for that. So, yeah. Oh, good. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you still read all the romance and I think you succeeded. I definitely Thank felt you. the KJ <laughs> alias vibes. Like I felt the whole, like, I have no musical talent or I'd try to hum the soundtrack to Alien, <laughs> but it was like going through my head dun, dun, yeah. as I was reading the book. <laughs> um, okay. So one of the things that I love about this book is how tropey it is. Um, mm -hmm. And it has a lot of my favorite tropes. Um, and one of them is the grumpy sunshine romance. And so I'm really curious, like, did you intentionally set out, like, when you decided to like go down this road, like I'm going to write a grumpy sunshine romance, or did it just happen naturally with Sawyer and Zoe? I think it just, this genre kind of, these, these, these archetypes really just lend themselves to that. Um, and when you think about these characters' backstories or, and, 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 their present stories, it, it just kind of tracks because, uh, and I always go back to like, I like a like, you know, balance kind of thing. And so I would think a lot about like, 
you know, Zoe clearly has amnesia. That's the central print. Like that was the one thing that could not change is Zoe has amnesia. And I, you know, if you've got a, a heroine who all in the world she wants is to remember, then the balance of that is you have to have a hero who all the world he wants is to forget. And so you, you put those two people together and you know, what does he want to forget? What, it, what kind of demons is he trying to outrun? And, and that, got, that guy's got to be grumpy. And so she, I think, because she has lost not only her good memories, but she's also lost her bad memories. And so like, I, I was wondering, like, what would it be like to wake up with a totally fresh start, just clean slate? And even though clearly and obviously she's going through some stuff, that in a way she is, you know, he's trying to outrun his demons and she doesn't even remember hers. And so it just, it just kind of falls into that kind of archetype. And, and I do love it. I love it because I think that's where you, that's where you get your great banter. Like is when you, you know, that's, that's when you get your classic, you know, all the old rom-com movies and, and everything like that. There's always, you can't have two people who, you know, are on the same page of these things. They've got they've got to be playing off of each other, and so I love it so much. I love it as a reader, and it, I love writing it. It's the most fun. I love it, and it's so interesting because I feel like it really shows in the approach, like um, that you were like, oh, she doesn't remember the bad stuff either. And I'm just thinking of when she's like, oh, I was spy exclamation, <laughs> and it just makes it so fun because it's not like. I'm a spy or she's scared. She's just like, this is the awesomest thing ever. <laughs> Great thing. Like, and, and that was another sort of part of the origin of it is, you know, there's this long history in pop culture of, of spies with amnesia. You've got Jason Bourne. You've got a whole season of Alias. You've got Gina Davis and Long Kiss Goodnight. You've got, you know, just a, that, that whole, like I woke up and, you know, and that I had this muscle memory. It's, and it's, it's always the muscle memory that gets me. It's like, oh, but I can do this and this and this. And I was like, if I ever woke up with amnesia, like my muscle memory would be like, I'm so good at kneading bread. Like, you know, it was, it was, I can, eat. Look, ooh, I can, you know, it, who knows what it would be. And so I, I, I've always thought it would be hilarious that some, you wake up and everybody expects that to be your muscle memory, but it's not. And so that was, that was a bit, another big part of the origin sort of of this is, is playing to that, those classic spy moments. I, I love it. And I think, yeah, I, it was really funny because that, I don't want to like spoil it, (laughs) but you nailed it. You absolutely (laughs) nailed it. Um, The other challenge from a craft standpoint was how long do you let that go on? Like, how long do you like, cause there's a version of this movie where she spends the whole, or the book where she spends the whole book thinking she's a spy like you know there and so that was that was honestly sort of the the oh, after I got off the phone with Rachel that was my only problem was and how do I how long do I let that drag on and um and how did she figure it out and I was like no he could just tell her like you know that if it's something that's you can fix it like that you should and yeah. so that's that's how that worked out that is, I think that is, I think that's good advice <laughs> for writing and life. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to um, ask a little more about tropes because I just love talking yeah. about tropes. And I also just love like how you embraced it so much. Like did, it sounds like, you know, the grumpy sunshine came really naturally, but what about some of the other tropes? And I kind of don't want to spoil um, some of the other things that happened. Were those naturally, or did you like plot it out? Like, Ooh, I want to also use this in this moment. No, I, I didn't really think of it in terms of making a list of tropes and be like, I want this one and I want this one and I want this one. It was really more organic to the story. So um, one of the things that I really, a lot, and a lot of these tropes are frequently stacked. So like road trip, forced proximity, only one bed. The, like that's a bundle like that. You can bundle that from your cable company like that. Those just go naturally together very, very easily. And I knew I wanted it to be a road trip story because personally, like my like top secret writer craft advice is if you can't figure out what to write, write a road trip because road trips have an inherent structure. It's almost like you're not sitting down with a blank piece of paper. You're sitting down with a coloring book. Like a road trip gives you lines 
And so that I, I very much wanted to write a road trip because also like I was thinking in terms of like a romancing the stone or even born identity. Those are all road trip stories. And so it's two people who are, people are chasing them and they're trying to get someplace. And so road trip, only one bed, like, how do we get there? How do we keep people from like trying to kill us? Oh, obviously we're going to pretend to be a married couple, you know? And so you get your fake dating and you get, you know, just a lot, so many tropes. And I personally am just absolute pudding for touch her and die. Like give, give me that every day of the year. Um, so, you know, some of those things are just, are just really naturally inherent to this type of story. Uh, so I, I, I did worry, like, is it too tropey? Do I have to, or are people going to think that I like made this very convoluted thing just to have trope on top of trope? That it, it really wasn't that way. It's just, these are just very organic into the things that I like. Yeah, I, I don't believe in too tropey personally. Like I don't, I really don't. And it, yeah, no, definitely not. It was perfect for me. Um, going along the lines of the road trip, I'm really curious how you decided like to choose Europe as a location. Um, like, and it sounds like Paris just kind of came naturally, but like, yeah. I'm really curious. And did you do any like travel for research? Um, yes, it really just started with Paris. Like Par- Paris chose me. I didn't so much choose Paris. Uh, from a really practical standpoint, like you're ne- probably never going to have a book like this set in the, in the U.S. because the CI can't operate in the United States. Um, it has to operate outside of the country. And uh, Europe, you know, again, you've got foreign identity, which is, you know, you got Suspanx and you've got the mountains and you've got the snow and all of these types of things. I had also just finished a, um, a spec script that's set in Switzerland. And so I had, a, I, I, I had the Alps on my brain and I was like, oh no, I want to do, I want to do you know, like snowy Alps because the other part piece of this, of course, is survival story. And so you have to have not only people posing a threat to them and 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 the characters themselves are posing a threat to each other but you also have to have the environment posing a, a threat and so it's it would be really hard to do this kind of story um you know in a safe environment and so I wanted them I wanted the weather to be a challenge I wanted the terrain to be a challenge and so like I I won I wanted freezing rivers and icy mountains and uh you know I, I, I wanted the, you know, mother nature to be just another villain that they're facing. And so I left out in that regard. Oh, I love that. Um, Thank you. Okay. So, um, okay. I'm going to go back because I skipped a lot <laughs> of my questions. So I'm going to go back to spies because okay. you said you love Always. spies. And I love spies. Um, and I love the way you wrote spies in this book. Um, it just felt like everything about it felt like so effortless to read and quick and clever. And this bit was just like super easy, but I'm imagining like it probably wasn't super easy. So I'm curious, what was the trickiest part? What was the easiest part? And what was the funnest part? Ooh, trickiest part. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out Sawyer's backstory. That was a little bit tricky because I, I always like, I, I kept telling people that this book and I probably all of the, the rom-coms that I'm going to hopefully write, which hopefully will be a lot. Um, they're like Venn diagrams. And so you've got, these are the things that a thriller would do. These are the things that a romance would do. These are the things that a comedy would do. And you're trying to hit that tiny place where they all overlap. And so you can give him a mega dark backstory but then that takes you out of that comedy bubble or it, it's like, is it romantic at that point? Like, I, I don't, I don't know. Like it's definitely not funny though. And so you're trying to really find a balance of something that can kind of screw a guy up that isn't going to be like, Oh yeah. And we will never laugh again. Um, so it's, you're, you're really trying to find that. And so actually I was, uh, and this actually ties into the other thing that was really hard was figuring out the ending. And now, now it's hard to talk about because I don't really don't want to spoil. Um, but I was looking at, I, like I said, I wanted to set some things in the Alps. And so um, I was researching like the highest peaks in the world and the, you know, because they have all these really cool 
um, sort of touristy things that you you take a little tram up to the top and it's got a big like tourist center thing where you can eat at a restaurant and take your picture and and do all this stuff. And I didn't realize there was like a whole tourism industry around just going really tall places. Um, but there was one that I guess is still open, but it was used in a James Bond movie. And so I was like, well, I don't want to get too similar to that. So I should probably watch this old James Bond movie. And it's Her Majesty's Secret Service, if anybody wants to watch it at home. And I was watching it. And um, that is where I kind of got the idea for what like Sawyer's backstory would be. Um, which now that I have started this, I'm like, oh, that's kind of a spoiler too. So I'm not going to go too deep into it. Um, but yeah, figuring out that backstory and figuring out sort of how the physical um, climax came together, that those were the two hardest things probably. And then your other questions was, what was the most fun? Was that right? And what was you know, the what was easiest? The easiest was just the overall structure of the story. Because again, I cheated and I wrote a road trip. Like it's really cheating. It is straight up cheating to write a road trip because it can be so like, again, you're, you're painting my numbers and that you start off at a place and you're trying to get to a place and things are going to happen along the way and the end. So that, that was, that was the easiest part. The most fun, I loved, I loved all of their dialogue. Like I could, I could write Zoe Zawyer dialogue for a year and, and never run out of stuff. I think because again, because they are naturally, um, you know, chemicals that react. And so, um, it was, it, I really had fun writing that. They had, they had such great banter. I Thank remember you. reading this arc and I was at my parents' house and, um, and I live by myself. So I'm normally not aware of this, although I don't know if it happens a lot. And I just kept laughing out loud and I was really aware of it because they were in the room. Just, <laughs> what is wrong with you? And I was like, this is just so funny. It's so funny. And that I was like, telling them everything that happened. Um, and it was interesting because I, I wondered how you approached the humor in the book. Cause it was that really good. You did such a good job of like achieving your Venn diagram. Cause I feel like sometimes I'll read books that I'm told are rom-coms, but they're missing the comedy or so what, and I think that's hard to do. I feel like it's, it's I want to be funny sometimes, but I'm always afraid, like, is this going to be too funny and then take away from the romance? But you had such a good balance. How did you do that? I think the key, at least for me, is I never don't try to be funny. It, it I think that's, I think I, I, if, if I put a book down because I, it's the comedy isn't working for me. Oftentimes it's something that it feels like I could, I can feel the stretch like, Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this really funny. And and so most of what I would consider to be the funniest parts in the book probably are things that when I wrote them, I, I didn't think it would be like that. That was not, that was just, that was just Zoe being Zoe. Like that, that was not, you know, me trying to make anybody laugh. Um, so I think that that's the key. Like in, in, when I think about books that I love to read that I think are very funny, for example, I think Allie Hazel is hilarious and, and it's, always the specificity of the things that she's writing. Um, I find really, really specific voicey things to be so much funnier than she was walking down the street, she twisted her ankle and fell. You know, that that I don't always, because I think that there's, it's one of the things that's really, really hard about writing comedy is there are things that are funny when Sandra Bullock does it in a movie. And then there are things that are funny when you read it in a book. And they're often two different things. And so that is, I think, one of the big, big challenges of comedy is trying to figure out what's going to work on page versus what works on screen. Yes, I've never thought of it that way because yeah. I, I don't attempt to write comedy. Like whenever <laughs> anything is funny, it's always unintentional. And I'm very glad when I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't mean that, but I'm glad you think. And, and, and the really hard thing about comedy too is, it's so personal. Like people will come, people will, you know, show me a line or a highlighter and then I'll put it on Instagram or something. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, I fell out of my chair laughing when I read this. And I'm like, that, 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 that you thought was, fun? which I'm glad they did, but I'm like that. I never in a million years would think that that was a line that's, that would crack somebody up, but it did. 
And so you just, and, and lines that I think are just hilarious, people are like, hey, whatever. And so it's, it's just such an incredibly personal thing. This is true. This is true. I'm like, always like the things that I'm like, oh my gosh, this was the best thing. No one ever comments it. And then it's other things that I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Like, and, and don't you love it when your editor like leaves a little note in the, in the manuscript or whatever being like, oh my gosh, love this. I'm like, thank goodness you said that. Cause I was getting ready to cut it. Like, you just don't yes, know. yes. Thankfully, I feel like my editor does get my sense of humor. So even if no one else thinks the things I think are funny or funny, like my editor does usually like she'll laugh at like the things that I'm like, yeah, I was happy to write this. And she's like, this is great. I'm like, okay, at least one person. Yeah. Okay. It is tough. It really is. Because again, we can get a little punch drunk. Like, uh, you know, it's 2 a.m. and I'm editing and I'm cracking myself up. Am I going to crack anybody else up? Yes. Yes. I feel like that with pretty much almost everything I write. I'm like, I have no, I, I feel like this could be the best thing in the world or it will absolutely make no sense to anyone in my career. And I'm going to open up a snow cone stand. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of the questions I always like to ask is like, did you do any research? And if so, what was the most interesting thing you discovered in the course of your research? I had done a lot of spy research in doing the Gallagher girls. So I, you know, I don't know that I did that much additional research for this uh, spy wise. Um, I did do like the, the Alps research and the, the scenic overlook, those types of things. I, I did a, I did a lot of research about those. Like, you know, where, where are they? You know, how are they built? Um, that type of thing. Um, and then I also, I did, a, did some research into twins because I, I knew that something in Zoe and her sister's backstory you know, because I, I, I went back and forth, like, do I do like, do I go full parent trap and they don't even know each other? Like, is that the big twist in the third act that, that Alex is like, who the heck are you? You know, that, that there's, that's an interesting book, but it's a different book. And so sometimes that's one of the hardest parts about the book is I can see 15 different books here that are all of them good, but which one am I going to pick? And so um, I did, a, so I didn't, I knew that I figured, I finally decided that I wanted the girls to know each other. They grew up together as sisters, but they weren't close. And so I had to figure out sort of why that, that would be and um, why Zoe would maybe be a little more delicate and, you know, what is, what does Zoe had to forget? Why did forgetting make Zoe so much braver? And so that, that, that I did have to do a lot of research on. And I have a cousin who, I don't know how spoiler this, this is, but um, she had to have some surgeries when she was a baby. And so when she was like, you know, three days old, you know, they cut open her heart kind of thing. And so I was like, uh, Abby, like, do you have any scars? And she, she actually sent me a picture. Like she was like, I am here and I am here. And so she went through that whole thing. I was like, oh, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. And so um, that, that I wanted to be very careful and, and, and sensitive about. Wow. Okay. Well, you did, you did a great job with that. (laughs) Um, okay. So I, I don't want to spoil anything, but the ending left me feel as it left me feeling as if you could write a spinoff or a sequel. And so I don't know if you can answer this, but, um, will there be more in this? I would like to write a a book for perhaps, uh, a, a, another character that looks very similar to the heroine of this book. Um, but I haven't, um, that's not set in stone yet. Um, so when, when I did this deal, I have a long track record of absolutely botching sequels. Like sequels are the bane of my existence. They, I have, I, they're so hard. They're so, do you like writing sequels? Oh, you're, you're the one. I feel like my problem is, I was thinking about this. I was like, I feel like I shouldn't say this, but my sequels are better than the first That's... book series. Like I do. I feel like the sequel is like what I'm writing towards uh-huh. my problem, but it's like, uh, yes, I like, I'm writing towards this moment in the sequel. And so I feel, cause I'm like, I like kind of the slow build up towards a big moment. And no, I get that. 
So in a lot of ways, the sequels is, yeah, I get that. Um, for me, it always, I, I, I think because the first sequel that I did was Cross My Heart and Hope to Spy, which was the second Gallagher book, which is everybody's favorite Gallagher book. So um, I'm like, I, how this happened, I have no idea. But I still had my day job at the time. And it just like, it was kind of a perfect storm of things not going right. And so it kind of gave me a block about sequels, I think. And I, I have learned a lot from that. And, and also this would not be a true sequel in this sense. Like this would be different characters. This would be a totally different story. But I was still a little bit, afraid to actually have one under contract. And so I actually had another story that I was very, very, very excited about. And so I, when I um, pitched the book to, to my editor, I said, like, I want to do Blonde Identity. And then would it be the dumbest thing ever to do a not spy book second? And she's like, no, I, I like that. Let's do that. And so we haven't announced what this new book is going to be yet, but I, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be out next fall. And I think it's really fun. It's, it's the kind of thing that I've never done before. And yet you're all going to be like, Oh, obviously. Yeah. Duh, she's doing that. So it's, it, it is, it is totally different. And it, yet also exactly the same, which like, I always think of romance sequels as being that like romance, writing a series in romance is constant or really any book is writing a book that is exactly the same, but totally different. Like you want people to have the same experience. You want them to have the same feelings. You want them to have the same rush, but it can't feel like the book they just read. And so this new one, it'll be totally different characters. It'll be totally different everything, but it kind of feels the same, I think. So I'm excited about that, but I would love to do an Alex book. I, I really, really would. And hopefully, hopefully that'll work out. I, I actually, because I had this like whole fear of sequels thing, I was like, I'm not going to propose it until I know exactly what it is. So I've spent like three months now outlining and I've never had an outline this specific about what it is, but I know, I know exactly what the book is now. And I, I'm excited about it. Ooh, well, I'm excited, but I'm also I'm also very excited about what this other book is. I feel like it sounds it sounds great and I'm sure I will love it just as much as the Alex book that I will I love. I hope so. It's 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 hard. It's 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 a challenging genre that I've never really worked in before. Um but it's still it's still very much a rom-com. Like it's 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 going to be fun. I hope. I am well I'm a big romance reader so I'm like I feel like yeah. that's Yes. So I am super excited. Okay. Um, I have, I think I have time to get my last two questions in before the lightning round. Okay. So, um, I, okay. I'm not exaggerating when I say that the blonde identity has been my favorite read this year. Um, it has, I just loved it. And so I would love, and I'm guessing everyone out there would love book recommendations for when they finish this book to know if they enjoyed this book, what should they read next? Oh gosh. I, I don't even like, I know, I always know this, like, what are you reading or what do you recommend is always coming. And I'm like, and at that point, every book I have ever read just disappears out of your mind. Like I've never read a book before. What are books? Um, I need to like, remember this and actually write this down. Uh, there's a new book out that's called to have and a heist um that I have not had a chance to look at yet but it's a heist book and it's a rom-com so I have a feeling that my readers would probably be all over that action there is a book and I don't ask me any authors I'm doing really well just to remember some titles here um there is a book called Char- I think it's Charlotte Isles is not a detective and the premise of this one is adorable so basically Nancy Drew grew up and doesn't want to be a detective anymore and everybody's like hey Nancy we got a mystery for you to solve she's like not my business and so she just really does not like she hates that she is like this world famous child detective and then of course she gets like sucked back into like the case of her career and it's adorable and so I and I, I don't know that I would necessarily class that classify that one as a romance but definitely like her personal trials and tribulations. I think it's probably going to be one of those that, you know, a lot of times in mystery series, there's like the overarching ro- romantic interest. And I haven't actually gotten to the end yet. So I'm not really sure how that all actually ties up, but that if I were writing that series, that's what I would be doing. Um, but it's, it is, it's got a lot of really, really great voice. And I just, I love the idea of like, 
a, a famous girl detective grew up and is kind of like just a jaded woman who's really out of the business and doesn't want to touch it anymore. But of course they suck her back. That sounds really fun. It gives me kind of um, Veronica Mars vibes. Yes. It's got a, that Veronica Mars. It's it's really got a great, it's got that Veronica Mars voice. And, and I'm, I'm kind of a voice snob. I love a good voice. Like I love voice. And so, and this one's got a really good one. I'm the same voice voice is so much of the book for me. Like if yeah. a book is good voice, I'm like, I don't care what this is about. I, I will, I will go, I will go down this road with you. Yeah. Okay. Last question before the lightning round. I know we're getting close and then we're going to have audience questions. So if y'all have questions, be thinking about them or typing them into the box where whatever the questions go. <laughs> about to there. So, okay. Um, okay. I could have read this wrong, but okay. Is this your 19th book? This is 19. Yeah. Okay. Which Depending is on how you, kind of how you count. Like there was like a nonfiction book tucked in there. So I don't know if we count that, we, but we count that. We count, we that. count that. Okay. We count that. Okay. okay. So yeah, it's 19. 19. I feel like 19, you know, like such a hard ladder to climb. So, um, I would love any advice. I mean, part of this is me personally as a writer wanting the advice, but I'm going to just say, cause I don't know that everyone out there is a writer. Um, any advice to having a long career? The, maybe the very first romance writers of America convention that I went to, uh, I, they used to have, I used to go every two or three years and they would have these sessions called like a conversation with Nora Roberts or a chat with Susan Elizabeth Phillips or, you know, tea time with Jane Ann Krantz or something. And you would go to this big conference room and this like absolute legend would get up at the front of the room and be like, Hey, I'm Nora Roberts. Who wants to ask me a question? And I'd be like, oh. full Hermione Granger in the front row, you know, because that's, Lord freaking Roberts. And the very first one that I went to, someone asked, and I, I, I apologize, I can't remember exactly who it was. It was one of those three. It was Susan Elizabeth Phillips or Jane and Grants or Nora. And asked her that question. And, and she just kind of started going through pin names. And she was like, well, the first books I wrote were the, under this name. I did, I did eight books under this name and then that market crashed. And then I did seven books. And I did, then I just switched to historicals under this other name. And then that market crashed. And then I started writing paranormals under this name. And then that market crashed. And like, before you know it, you know, she's got 65 books laid out there. And, and that's, that has never left my mind. Because what that taught me is that my book, my business is writing books. And I just have to keep writing. You just, you, you don't you know, TikTok your way into, you know, having a career. You don't blog your way into having a career. You don't, you know, network your way into having a career. You put your butt in the chair and you write. And that, like, that sort of, you know, workhorse mindset, I am grateful every day that I was exposed to that as a baby writer because it really, really sunk into me. And so I, that's, you know, like I was, talking with Rachel and I, I wasn't thinking about leaving the business, but I was like, I, I don't know what to write. She's like, you just have to keep writing. And, and that's, that's just what you do is you just keep writing and um, you just keep writing. That's how you I have love, long careers. You don't stop. I love that advice. I actually think that's such great advice because I think so often it's like, oh, well you need to write, but also, you know, it, social media. It's really, it's hard. Like and, and, and it's true. It is part of the job. I mean, this is, this is part of the job and it's a fun part of the job. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to have, you've got to finish books. There was a back in years and years ago, I'm an uncle. Uh Uh-oh. Like you just, you, you just keep making buckets and you make more buckets than the other guy. And, you know, we can talk about all of this extremely, you know, complicated stuff, but at the end of the day, you make buckets. And at the end of the day, we write books and you just keep writing. I love it. Okay. Since I know we're getting close to audience questions, I'm going to quickly go through my lightning round questions. Yes. I love lightning round questions. I love okay. lightning round. Okay. Okay. Mistaken identity or secret identity? Mistaken. 
your go-to spy disguise? Pregnancy. Chuck Bartowski or Ethan Hunt? Ethan Hunt. Sarah Walker or Sydney Bristow? Sydney. Current read. <laughs> Never read a book ever in my life. Um, oh, I'm reading Business or Pleasure. Um, okay. And your most anticipated read for 2023? Whatever Allie Hazelwood is writing. Oh, a vamp- she has a vampire book. Yes. Oh, yeah, she does have a vampire book. That's gonna be that's gonna be bonkers in a good way, I think. Oh my gosh, I'm <laughs> very, very excited. I can't remember the name of it, but I'm like, I can't wait to read this. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. That Allie Hazelwood book is called Bride because I'm also stalking it. <laughs> oh, doesn't it look so good? It looks amazing. Amazing. I just, I love her for being like, yes, I'm, you know, let's, let's, let's throw everything I'm famous for out the window and just do it. And I'm like, that's literally what she said. She's like, sometimes you have to write for fanfic ish books to keep <laughs> your publishers yeah. into letting you write the vampire werewolf romance of your dreams. Yeah. And you know, I'm here for that energy. I'm here for it. Yeah. Um, so before we get to audience questions, yeah. I'm going to share my screen here because Allie, some of your fans have a little surprise for you. Um, they wanted to share their appreciation for all of the things that you have done. It's from the Alleyverse, your Discord group. So they uh, made you a little something. Oh my gosh. Just give me one second. All right. and it does not have sound but you can see oh my gosh is not said. you guys and that's the gift from the alleyverse um and we have a gift to the alleyverse uh love sweet arrow will be offering 15 percent off for the rest of the month at love sweet arrow off of everything so you guys go bananas i will definitely be sending this out in a newsletter um so we'll be celebrating the alleyverse today and for the rest of the month uh, to just celebrate this amazing accomplishment for the blonde identity. Thank you. And now that we've like <laughs> made you all teary eyed, <laughs> it's time for some questions from the audience. Let's so do it. Uh, it. The chat has been 
intense. Um, <laughs> once you're off here, like I encourage you to go back and look at all of the love that both of you are getting. Um, everybody is snooping for spoilers. So um, I'm not, an- I'm not asking those questions, guys. Like I just, I can't, I'm not, I'm not a spoiler fan, so I'm not going to do that to everybody. But uh, so one of the questions that came up here was a question for both from Sydney. When did you find out that you wanted to be a writer? My answer is pretty um, easy. I was in middle school and I read a copy of The Outsiders by Essie Hinton. And she was from um, Tulsa, which is where I live now. And I grew up on a farm about an hour outside of Tulsa. And uh, my dad told me that she lived in Tulsa. And I thought, oh, well, that's that's what girls like me do is we write books. And then Tom Cruise stars in the movie. And so I am a massive, massive proponent for letting people you know, being able to see people like you do a thing is I think one of the most important things in the world because that I would not be doing this right now if if a teenage girl from Oklahoma hadn't written a book. And so I I think that that's very, very important. And I think, you know, not only just mentorship, but just, you know, being being able to see that it's possible, showing people that things are possible is important and it matters. And you might not realize it now. You may not realize it, but there is somebody out there looking up to you. And so don't ever forget that. So that's that's my high horse today. All right, and you, Stephanie? Oh man, I um I don't remember as well because I think it was around the fourth grade. I remember in the fourth grade um writing little books with my friends. And I wrote like a picture book that a friend illustrated that we thought was super clever about like animals going to a museum. And one of the animals was robbed. She had like this huge diamond ring. And then it was like during a blackout and the lights went out. And then in the end, we thought we were so clever. I still like this idea because you, we made the whole book. You had to open it and there was like a seal, but it was actually a seal, like the animal that you like opened. And there was like a picture, like the whole, like what actually happened. And so I remember writing books with friends in the fourth grade. I also wrote like a sci-fi book and I just, I wanted to do it. Um, but then I didn't think I could because um, especially back then in the 80s, pre-internet, I didn't have access to information. I didn't know anybody. Um, I didn't know anybody who was a writer. And so I actually, um, like in high school, I did my senior project on how to write and publish a children's book. And I uh, failed it because I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. And I didn't have the help and I didn't have the information. And it wasn't until like I had a whole other career path and um, that I decided, like, I just finally pursued it because I loved it so much, but I wanted to do it for a long time. But then it took me, it actually took me a really long time to like get up the courage to do it. And it was only because I loved it so much, but I was, I was terrified. I don't have um, the educational background to write. I don't have, I didn't, I didn't have any, I felt I didn't have any business to write. So kind of like going along with like Allie and seeing like other people, like I just say this for anyone who wants to be a writer, who maybe feels like they can't because they don't have the proper schooling or this or that. Like the great thing about writing is none of that matters. You just have to be able to tell a good story. And um, I was a terrible writer when I started. I just knew I loved storytelling and I learned so much from reading books and blog posts on the internet and making friends. Yeah, same. And the great thing about this job is you can do it for free. You, you don't have to invest um, you know, $80,000 in an education for it. You don't have to invest in a bunch of equipment or anything. You have to invest your time. That is it. And time is valuable. Don't get me wrong. But you, you can, and you can do it from anywhere. Like it is, as far as like big dream career go, careers go, it's about as safe as one as you can find. And so that's, you can do it. Yeah. All right. I mean, wow. I'm like full of feelings. So, and 
the next question is from Deanne Davidson, and it's, it's for the both of you again. What is the biggest thing that you have learned about yourself as a writer or because of writing? I know it's one of those ones where like, immediately, like I've learned nothing. What are you talking about? <laughs> I, I think I've just learned kind of what I'm capable of. You know, you, you get your back up against the wall and you're like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And it's really, really easy to, to live on. I can't do it Island. And this, the nice thing about this career is eventually you have to swim off of that island. Like, you, like that, even if you are, if you do make it to the point where you're doing it professionally, you've got books under contract and people are counting on you and you've got to deliver, you, you learn how to swim. And so I think that's maybe the biggest thing for me is there, there comes a time with every single book where I'm like, I can't do it. I, it's. I'm going to have to buy the book back. Like I, I'm, I'm out, you know, I can't. And, you know, I've got wonderful, beautiful friends who are like, you do, you realize you literally say this every single time. I'm like, but this time it's true. And then, okay, well, you know, you can do it. So that, that's probably it for me, Stephanie. Oh man. You know, I feel, I feel like the same. I feel like, I mean, yes, every book I want to like, I, I think I'm going to have to give the money back and open up my snow cone stand. But also I think the same too was just like, I wanted this career so badly. And like I was saying, um, I didn't have the education and I didn't, I, I, I knew I had to be better at it. And so, um, and one of the things for me is I'm, I'm actually incredibly shy, like painfully shy. And I remember I was like, I can do this, but I never want to go to a writer's conference. I never want to, I never want to go around other writers because I'm not, I'm not a real writer and I'm, and so I've had to like really learn. And I say this for anyone who, cause I feel like a lot of times I'll meet writer, like readers that come to book signings and I'm like, this is my first time. And they seem terrified. And that was me like terror of everything. And so I felt like learning like, okay, wait, I don't have to be scared of other people. I can do this. I can be the friendly one. I don't have to wait even for other people to like reach out to me. Cause most people, most people want to connect with other people and they're not mm -hmm. scary. And you know, the world's not like the safest place, but I feel like the book community, especially there are so many people want, people want to connect. And I think that's one of the reasons people read, even though, um, it is a solo thing. I feel like you connect with, you read, I read to connect with people. And then I think also it's something that people do in community because you read and you mm -hmm. talk about books. And so I feel like, um, you know, kind of like that is one of the biggest things I've learned just about me personally. And that's beautiful. And I just think that that's so wonderful of a thought because reading is technically a solitary activity. It's you and the page or you and your audiobook, um, or you and your digital device of choice. Um, <laughs> but what it is at its core is a sharing of experiences, a sharing of ideas, a sharing of places and things and wonder that you would never get to experience otherwise. And in a community where you're able to share those things collectively around the same time, like at a launch party like this, mm -hmm. that you're able to have these experiences collectively, like, and I'm going to date myself a little bit, but it's like when you were watching TGIF on ABC <laughs> back in the nineties and everybody watched Family Matters and Step by Step and Boy Meets World all at the same time. And you knew that when Monday came around and you hit that playground, you're going to talk about what Corey and Topanga did. But this is that community and it's so fun and so wonderful. Um, and I just think that, you know, looking through the chat and seeing all of these people just in love with the worlds that you have created over your careers, it's just amazing that words on a page can bring so many people together. Um, yeah. And I think, and I think post pandemic, it's just that much more, you know, it's amplified. Like I, I think about like people, everybody wearing pink to go to the Barbie movie. 
like who just nobody decided that but like just community kind of rose up or you know I had the great privilege of taking my nieces to see Taylor Swift and the you know the total strangers turning around to me like you want to take friendship bracelets and it, it's we we created the I think we've been so hungry for this and you're right the the book community is is just because we all love stories and we love the same stories and we love you know tropes and and genres and and authors and it, it, we're all just looking for people to connect with I think yeah I I think that that's that's what we're all looking for it's just we've been trapped in our houses for like three years so you know let's let's find ways to reach out to one another to find that community to find that that just communal experience so I think that that's wonderful um one of the questions that I see here I've seen it like five times already. Um, is there any hope for Heist Society book four? <laughs> I am not ruling that out. Like, is is that under contract? Is that in the works? No. And have I always thought of that as a series that I could go back to? Yes. Like, I can say pretty decidedly that I, I don't think I'll write another Gallagher book. I feel like that one's wrapped up. Heist, I feel, is more episodic. And so um, I feel like that could be like, in, you know, I, 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 I would never say, I would never rule that out. Yeah. And then I've got a question for you, Stephanie. I've got multiple people ask like, are you going to continue writing books in the Caraval universe or will you be done? And then like the next like three questions in a row are like, can you tell us any snippets? What can you tell us? <laughs> Um, I can say that I love writing in the Caraval universe and it is a big universe. Um, I don't think I can say what I'm doing next and it's actually like not even decided what I'm doing next. Um, <laughs> but, um, I like personally, I, I will revisit that universe as long as there are people who want to go there with me. So like, I definitely would love to write more stories in that universe, um, and then, oh gosh, I don't know if I have anything. I, I can say this, that over the next two months, I will be able to share a little more, little, little snippets, but probably not right now. Cause I like Ali, when you ask her what her books that she's liked, I cannot remember anything that happens in any That's of my books. <laughs> you the exact moment you're like I didn't write that I don't know what you're talking about that <laughs> I don't know what happened. my brain into the pages and now it is no longer my problem <laughs> um somebody had asked uh on the con had said a you guys are amazing wanted to ask how do you deal with the writer's block hmm uh, Cassie Claire, who's a friend of mine, always says that if if you've got a what is it? writer's block is not a problem. Writer's block is a symptom. And so you have to go deeper and figure out what your underlying problem is. And so I think that's uh, at least uh, it's always been true for me in that if there's something that's not working in the book, the I will be like, eh, I, I can't you know, it, it just, everything feels a little off. It's like having a pebble in your shoe or something. And so you have to stop and kind of maybe back up a few pages. Um, oftentimes what I have to do in, in those situations, the most is just take a break. Like you go to the movies, you, you go for a walk, you clean your house, you do something that, that is, that is not working on the book. And the answer a lot of times will land. And a lot of times for me, it's something really weird. It's like, Oh, it's like, for those of you maybe at home who read Uncommon Criminals, like I couldn't get it and I couldn't get it and I couldn't get it. And I was like, oh, Uncle Eddie's a twin. Okay, now check. And then boom, 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 boom. Everything just fell into line. And so there's usually one like linchpin kind of thing like that, that I haven't figured out yet. And as soon as I figure that out, it's like that, those um, TikToks or whatever, those guys who lay bricks, you know, and they have them all up like that. And then they get to the end and they tap and they just pop, 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 pop. that's that's what happens. And so you just have to kind of step back. And be like, what am I missing? Stephanie? Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I've I agree with all of that. I also recently read something that really resonated with me. It was talking about boredom. 
and how boredom is important for creativity. And it was like this whole, have you read this? It was like this whole big piece. I'm, I'm very bad at science, so I'm going to do a terrible job repeating it. But it was basically saying that when you get bored, your creativity starts to spark. And so I think that's part of the reason why sometimes stepping away. So I think like for me, after I finish a book, I feel like I'm done. I'm never going to write. I can't write again. And so lately I've been trying not to like do anything and to let myself be just kind of do a little more nothing, which is hard. Cause I feel like I like to be busy and I'm not good at it. And my mom never let me say I was bored growing up. So I've never been a person to be bored. So I've just been trying to like take more moments. And I have found, cause it like the article was saying it does it to your brain, but then also you find yourself being like, oh my gosh, if I'm not doing anything and then you want to write. And then I think some of those answers come. So mm-hmm. I think too, if you're not looking for an answer, but you just feel unmotivated to write, like don't necessarily try, like let yourself get bored. And then Mm -hmm. I think this, that for me is where I've been finding my inspiration for stories lately. That is so funny because my mom always said that only boring people are bored. So, or they'd like, if you've got time to lean time to clean, like go, (laughs) go do something like go, go do the dishes. If you're so bored, like that that's not what I was looking for here. I was looking <laughs> for something else. Yeah, um, bored is like a bad word in my house. <laughs> yeah. No, I learned how to not say that. So I think that's like how I got really deep into yeah. reading. I'm like, I'm just going to go find a book. Because if I say I'm bored, I'm going to be scrubbing baseboards. Yeah. I don't want to do that. So um, <laughs> one of the questions that I've seen here, um, you both have talked a lot about tropes that you love. Are there any tropes that you are not as big a fan of to write or to read? Enemies to lovers, I love it, but it's cha- it's it's harder than it looks because you have to find a thing that's big enough to make them enemies, but it's not so big that they can't overcome it. And and it's I think it. I don't know at my, I guess it could possibly be easier in like a fantasy world or a dystopian or something. Cause like, oh, they're, they're, you know, rival countries or, you know, rival families or something like that. Um, But in a contemporary setting, it's, I, 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 I struggle with that. I personally am trash for a secret baby. I love a secret baby. Um, I, I don't know that I could write one that would be hard to write. Uh, but again, it's like one of those things that I like any trope as long as it's done well. I think some of them are just harder naturally to do than than others because they they do kind of come with some baggage and, and challenges built in. There's a trope I don't like, but I don't ever like to say it because I feel like I don't like to be negative about other books. Um, and so I'm trying to think if there's one that I like to, I... You know, I think, yeah, I'm like, I feel like it's, I don't know if this is a trope so much. Like I really, like I have vampires in my Once Upon a Broken Heart series, but like, I love vampires and I wanted to write like a vampire romance forever. And I, it it was so hard for me to do it in the series. I can do it as a side character, as a side thing. Like I can do vampires on the side, a la carte or whatever, but I haven't found a story to make it work for like the main story, which kind of breaks my heart, but I don't know. But it's true. There are are characters that work as side characters that just don't work as a main character. And it's the character types or tropes or whatever. And it's, it's true though. It's, it's, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. And that brings me to another question. Um, (laughs) Someone, uh, Catherine McPhee asked, is there a specific genre of book that you would like to write that you haven't written yet? Hmm. There's a part of me that would really love to write like historical romance. Like I, I, you know, I, I probably never will because it's so, so different than anything I've ever done. But like, like, give me a Duke who is hot for the governess. Like, I, I like the old school. Like, I, you know, I want, you know, a highwayman and the, you know, marchioness. Like, I, I don't know. I, 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 I love it. And I, I, you know, I, th- those, those are sort of, I think because those are the books I kind of cut my teeth on. Mm-hmm. You know, you've always, there, you never love anything as much as you love, like the first, you know, 
thing that got you introduced to a thing. And so I like I, I can always tell what book of mine was the first book of uh, reader read because it's their favorite like oh what what is what is your favorite Ally Carter book it's not if I save you first what was the first Ally Carter book it was not if I save you first you know so it's always like and so historical romance are what made me learn to read to love romance and so I'm like part of me is like no you you leave that to like you know Miss Bev you leave you leave it to, you leave it to people who know what they're doing um but part of me is like I just kind of like want to write like fan fiction of it or something I don't know but maybe someday Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, and now that you say it, like the first like grown up romance I ever read was uh, Catherine Anderson. Like, I think it was um, Cherish. And it was like oh, a yeah. Wild West historical. And I am now absolute trash. <laughs> for it goes in the vein. It's just, you can't shake it can't shake it no it's also so good it's so good and now I want you to really write one Allie because I think it would be so much fun I might have an outline for three (laughs) 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 three is even better than one I mean someone in the comments said um historical spies Allie I, 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 there was a time and I will never do this, but there have been times where I have kind of dallied with the idea of actually doing historical Gallagher girls, like doing, doing the origin story that I, I never will. Um, but, but that, that is something that every now and then a little voice in my head is like, oh, you know, that, that would be interesting, but, and, and I probably would, I don't know. I don't know. It would, it, I, I'll never do it, but I do think that that I do think there's a good story in there somewhere. There's like four people who immediately chimed in and said, (laughs) excuse me, you should write Jillian Gallagher's story. And they're like, it would be amazing. Let's do that. Do that. It would be a thing. I don't know. I I probably caps. Take my money for historical (laughs) Gallagher girls. (laughs) All right, Stephanie, is there any genre that you wish that you could write or would love to write that you haven't written yet? There's a lot because I've only written in one genre. I've only done fantasy. Um, I really would love a spy book that I would love a spy book, but I don't know. I'm like intimidated by it. I'm super, I'm super intimidated. I don't know if I know how to write stuff that doesn't have magic because magical spies, magical spies. I would, I have like, I don't know how many of you have seen the blacklist. But like, I always think of like that pilot, which is an excellent pilot and spoiler for the pilot, the girl finds out like her husband's like has a whole secret stash of like uh, passports and money. And he's totally not who he said he would. And I just like, I think of that so often of like the relationship where you find out like the person you're with is a spy or someone evil or something like that. And I'm like, I want to take that and turn it into a story or just write a spy story. Like I am just... I'm such a sucker for a spy story, but I don't have one. I don't, I don't have a spy. I have like, I don't even have like a scene for a spy story other than that, that I like, which is not my seed. So maybe someday. Maybe. It's also okay to just have things you like to read. I think that that's, I think that that's also true. Though. It's like, you know, I, I, I love, a, I love a historical romance. Doesn't necessarily mean I meant to write one, you know, it's, it's okay to have things that you read just for pleasure. I do think that's true. But don't ever say you can't do it because I firmly, firmly, firmly believe. I know for a fact you can. You can do it. Thank you. I would, I think it'd be really fun because I do love spies. And then I also would love to do a paranormal historical, like, <sighs> um, like historical fantasy romance. So like, like yeah. almost like the Kristen Callahan series. I don't know if I... So she did a series that's like almost like borderline steampunkish and it's like Victorian England and there's werewolves and vampires and there's like instead of the tone it's like a whole caste system based on like the vampires ruling London. It's bonkers. I'm going to need to read this because I (laughs) 
I will definitely, I'm thinking like, I have not read those books, but I'm going to look them up right after this. I love like the Dark Days Club. Oh. Um, so maybe, but I don't know. I like had this idea. Like, it's just all I have is like, you know, it's like a ball and there's a Duke because there are always just lots of handsome Dukes really. Um, Thick on the ground. who is just really uncomfortable and like needs to get out of there because he's a secret werewolf. And that, that's, that's like this whole mo that's the only moment I have. And it wouldn't necessarily be, a mo- but I'm like, I feel like there's something there. I don't know what the story is, but werewolf, like, yeah. So. They have like all of the farmer's almanacs to track the moon, but maybe he got bitten by a dog or something when he was out on the moors mm-hmm. and didn't know. See, now, like, I'm like, now that you've said farmer's almanac, I'm like, suddenly there's like another seed. And yeah. just yeah. remember, blonde identity rattled around in my head for like going on 10 years. So sometimes these things have a long gestation period. I feel better because I just cleaned out my office and I found like all my historical research books with like all the stuff that I had bought all these books on like and read them or parts of them um, on like the fashion, on life, everyday life, like everything. And I just found them going through my office and I was like, oh, I mean, this, this sounds fun to me. If you want someone to bounce ideas off of, I can, I can sit here all day and talk about <laughs> you know right. Scottish werewolves in the 1800s see doesn't that just sound sexy Ooh. I I, yeah. I gave myself a tingle I was like oh <laughs> I know I'm like wait I hadn't even thought about making anyone Scottish and now I'm suddenly like yes Scottish werewolf already have- like tension with the English yeah, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just saying and maybe there's some vampires involved obviously, it's obviously. obviously vampires yeah. yes Okay, now that I've like gone down a rabbit hole of like plotting out Actually, like, normal historical like, magical fantasy. <laughs> an immortal duke is fascinating because he's always like his own heir. And he yeah, disappears oh and like has to show up. And he's like, well, I am the son of... Oh my God. Like it's there's something there. The Edward Cullen of the ton. I would read your immortal duke. It's a good title. I am mortal duke. Uh, Okay, that is a good title. We are so good at this. We should do this professionally, (laughs) (laughs) y'all. I really want to put like Immortal Duke on my TBR now. I'm like Immortal Duke by Allie Carter. I'm just saying Allie Hazelwood's getting ready to rip this all wide open and you're sliding right in there. Yeah, I mean... I write in. I really no. I really, really do want the like paranormal historical because I feel like there's not nearly enough of it, and I don't know why. Like I, I have thought about this way too much because I'm like, I, this is, I think after like reading a lot of historical, I'm like, where's all the paranormal historical? Yeah, there aren't a lot of them. So I know off the top of my head, there's the Kristen Callahan series, and that's an older one. Like I, I want to say like early 2000s maybe early 10s and then there is a series that is going on right now and it's through source books but I can never remember the author's name but I know that one of the titles was a wolf in duke's clothing and I was just like that clearly stuck in my head I have no idea who the author is so if anybody can tell me what that is and I'm probably going to google it later but like it was a wolf in duke's clothing and I just lost it I was like you have my attention what is this amazing there needs to be more of it more of it maybe you should write it maybe you should write it just maybe a little bit (laughs) write the book you want to see in the world Mm -hmm. and apparently we all want to see my immortal duke (laughs) um okay so i believe we have run a little bit over um as we are wont to do because we love talking books and ideas and romance and all of this is great oh someone in the chat said it was susanna allen yes that is the person with a wolf in duke's clothing thank you jess the lady of cheese (laughs) you are a woman after my own heart um yes so I'm so excited that you all were able to join us today. Uh, This has been such a fun, fun time. 
Ali, your Discord group has already messaged you that lovely tribute movie. So you will have that for your own records. Um, everyone, code Alliverse, A-L-L-Y-V-E-R-S-E. Yes, I can spell. Uh, for 15% off at Love Sweet Arrow, you should definitely get a copy of The Blonde Identity. We have some really sweet glasses that will come along with the book if you order them soon. Um, and... We should definitely order Stephanie's book. Yes, those exact glasses. I was going to like swipe them off of the main table uh, at the store, but I was told I should not be, I should not be taking things meant for customers. Um, and definitely order Stephanie's books, like the end of the Caraval series. It's just <sighs> end of an era, but we're on, we're going to see some new stuff from you. I'm sure of it. And I'm so excited. Um Thank you both for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure. And hopefully we will get to see my immortal Duke in the world at some point in the distant future. We need it. All right. Thank Brittany, you so thank much. you. You did a wonderful job. Yay. And thank, thank you everybody you. home for watching. Yeah.